Good morning, everyone. Oh, I love that. Love it. Good morning and welcome to day two and a half of the HDSA 33rd Annual Convention. We are so glad you are here and that you woke up nice and early to have a beautiful breakfast out in the sunshine and be a part of this fantastic research forum that we have planned for you today. I'm going to turn it over to today's presenters in just one moment, but we have a few special announcements. Who in the room attended last night's National Youth Alliance gala, uh, talent show? It was kind of like a gala. Thank you all for being there. Can we have a round of applause for all of last night's performers? Because of your generosity and the persistence of the HD youth, yesterday the NYA raised $27,000. And you can help them meet their goal of 30,000. We just need three more, 3,000 more dollars to help them hit their goal. And the NYA auction is still open. It'll be open until 11 o'clock today, out in the exhibit hall. So at the break, you'll have time to go out and donate generously. There are actually two special items still uh, at the raffle that I want to make sure I highlight. First and foremost, the Broda chair. For anyone who is interested in having a Broda chair for their loved one, we have a special raffle with the NYA to be able to get a chance to bring one of those home for you. It is shipped um, directly to you, so you don't have to pay United the extra 100 bucks to load it on the plane. Um, and then secondly, the four tickets that we have to the Jurassic World 2 premiere on Tuesday night here in LA are actually being included in the NYA auction. So if you're going to be, there's clapping over there, someone wants to go, there are four tickets waiting for you, Jan. Um, so if you're going to be in LA uh, on Tuesday evening and wanna go be with Bryce Dallas Howard and our own Dr. Eric Johnson, uh, please um, take a moment and uh, put in a raffle ticket at the NYA auction for that item. So the auction is open until 11 o'clock and at 12 noon at the lunch break, the NYA will be posting all of the winners. So make sure you have your ticket stubs handy so you can see what you're taking home. Last but not least, don't forget to turn in your stars. We have more than 300 beautiful gold stars from yesterday's Galaxy of Heroes luncheon that have been turned into the registration table. And all of those stars will decorate tonight's gala. Please take a few moments to finish decorating, add those final touches. Don't forget to add your name to the back and um, turn it in at the registration area so that we can display them tonight at our celebration. So everyone have a great day. Without further ado, I want to kick off the science feature this morning and introduce HDSA's very own Dr. George Yorling. Good morning, everyone. We are in for a show today, and I'm, I'm so delighted to see a room full of folks. Um, welcome to the 33rd Annual HDSA Research Forum. Um, before we get started, I just want to show, uh, run through the outline for today. Um, hopefully, before you came in, you got to see there were, we had a Don King Summer Research uh, Fellowship poster session outside um, and meet our bright young scientists that we're currently funding. Um, at the break, after this keynote address, the poster session, if you didn't get a chance to speak with them, they're going to be back out there. So please do stop by the posters and see, see the work that you're helping to fund. Um, at, after I'm finished here, we're going to have a, a first-of-its-kind kind of research keynote address, and, and I'm very anxious about this because after I thought about it, this is the first time we've had 10 people present, and uh, I'm hoping that this stage holds all of us when we're done. Um, but we're going to tell you a story, and we're, not, we're going to tell you a story um, about the, the creation of the first Huntington-lowering drug, and the idea here is to uh, show you just how much we're all working together, um, it's the scientists, clinicians, but most importantly, none of this would happen without the families. This started with families, and this story is gonna end with families. And hopefully you'll see that in our story today. Uh, we'll take a break, we'll have time for Q&A, we'll take a break, and then we're gonna move on to um, uh, the poster session, and then Jed Ed Wild and Jeff Carroll will join us for a presentation of 
on entitled "Which Wolf Will Win." So, stay tuned for what that what that means because I don't even know what that means. <laughs> um, As I mentioned, this is a, a very, very excited to present to you a panel discussion, a storytelling of the, how families and researchers have come together to develop the very first Huntington Lowering Study. And I'm excited to have uh, Jim Casella uh, from Harvard University, uh, Ann Smith from Ionis, Holly Kordashowitz, I knew I'd mutilate it, I, I just can't say that last name, uh, from Ionis Pharmaceuticals. Uh, Robert Pacifici, the CSO from CHDI Foundation, Doug McDonald from CHDI Foundation, um, Ed Wild from UCL, Blair Levitt from the University of British Columbia, uh, Eric Lundgren from Roche, myself, and most importantly, an HD family member to, to close it all up um, and talk about how the, what this in exciting news means to her. So before we get started, I just want to introduce, uh, talk a little bit about the research that we're funding at HDSA and uh, just introduce some really special people. Uh, one of my favorite programs is our Don King Summer Research Fellow. And it's a place, it's an opportunity that HDSA gets to put young, bright uh, college undergrads and first year medical students in a, in a lab in somewhere in America to work with an HD expert and hopefully hook them so that they'll be up on this stage one day talking about the next treatment for HD. And uh, we have three of them here with us. These are last year's winners. Uh, Kiki Kim, can you please stand? And Paul Elizon and Chris Yannick. Thank you, guys. Please join them at, at, at 10.30 to see their posters. And um, you know, while they're here enjoying LA, we just announced this year's winners. And they are hopefully at home, maybe even on Saturday, working in the lab. We have announced four more winners, Jacob Freeman and Ethan Smith working at the University of Central Florida with Amber Southwell, uh, Wes Solom working at Western Washington, working with Jeff Carroll. Jeff, where are you? Is he working in the lab today? He's Wes, he's, he's in the lab. And, uh, and Scott Sung from Amherst College, who's actually working at Stanford this summer. So uh, hopefully, all four of them will be joining us next year in Boston, and you can hear about their exciting research. At HDSA, you're, you're going to hear about, the, throughout the rest of the day, uh, about the exciting progress we're making in the research pipeline. Um, and that's critically important. We all want treatments for HD. But at HDSA, we also believe that that pipeline of researchers and clinicians must be full. And that we take that very seriously. One of the things we do to, to combat that is we have a, a very unique program called the Berman Topper HD Career Development Fellowship. It's a mouthful, but it's a very, very special fellowship where we provide three years of funding, significant funding, for young researchers to get involved and hopefully make HD their career choice. Uh, last year, we awarded two to Dr. Tamara Maiori from McMaster University and Dr. Sarah Hernandez from University of California, Irvine. Tam and Sarah, are you here? Can you stand? Are you here? Oh, Sarah. Hopefully you saw them yesterday. They gave an amazing presentation on DNA repair and stem cells. And uh, congratulations to them. Uh, just a couple weeks ago, we awarded another Berman Topper Fellowship to Rachel Harding at the University of Toronto. Unfortunately, she couldn't be with us today um, because she doesn't have her passport to leave Canada yet. But Hopefully, she'll be with us in Boston. After we're done, don't go anywhere. We'll grab a box lunch. We'll be providing a lunch for you. Uh, and then come back in here, because then we're going to talk about um, all of the currently recruiting clinical trials and, and give you a little update on where they stand and how you can get involved. We're going to be hearing from Jamie Levy from CHDI on Enroll HD. Ed Wild will come back on the stage and talk about HD Clarity. Uh, you're going to hear from Marie Zotera, the CEO of Vasinex, to talk about the Signal trial. Finally, Wendy Erler from Wave Life Sciences is going to give you an update on the allele selective Huntington lowering study called Precision HD1 and 2. And then finally, you'll hear from our own Leora Fox, who's going to tell you about how to get, if you're interested in any of those studies, how you can get involved through HD Trial Finder. As if that's not enough, today is full of science. I think this is certainly the, the most full we've ever had, most science we've ever had in HDSA convention. It's because there's so many amazing things going on. Um, right after lunch, we have a Huntington Novel Therapies in Huntington Lowering session where you're going to hear from Pavlina Konstantinova from Unicure 
Um, she's going to talk about gene therapy approach for lowering hunting and CHDI's own Liz Doherty talking about a small molecule. Um, wouldn't it be great if we could develop a small molecule you could take orally to lower Huntington in your brain? That would be pretty sweet. So you'll hear about that at 1.30. Uh, at 2.45 to 3.45, uh, CHGI's own Amrita Mohan is going to be presenting on putting HD data to work. You've have, so many people have presented or participated in research in this room. She's going to tell you about how your data is being put to work to help us better understand this disease. And then finally, and from four to five, we have a really special session. I know you are not going to have, you're going to have a ton of questions about what's going on in the Huntington lowering field. We have organized a, a really informal and fun panel discussion from four to five with the Roche and Genentech uh, HD team. Uh, and that will take place in the Chicago Dallas room from four to five. So join us there. So, and finally, so before we turn it over to our esteemed panel of presenters, I just want to take a few minutes to recognize some special guests we have joining us today. In the past, we may have felt as if HD didn't get the attention that it deserved. Other diseases like you hear in the news, ALS and Hunt, Alzheimer's and Parkinson's are always in the news, but what about HD? Um, who's working on that? Well, what I can tell you with confidence is that we're incredibly fortunate to have one partner with tremendous resources in our corner whose sole focus is to find effective treatments for HD and only HD. This partner is CHDI Foundation. And since 2004, CHDI has dedica dedicated an incredible amount of money and effort to help find treatments for HD. And I'm really, really genuinely delighted to say that every member of CHDI, all 100 strong, has traveled from their offices in New York City, Princeton, New Jersey, and Los Angeles to join us here as we commemorate 50 years of service of HDSA. Each member of CHDI should be wearing a gray hoodie. Can you all stand up for us, please? And give them a huge round of applause. Look at this. They're going to be here all day joining us, which I'm delighted about. Stop them. Ask them. Ask them about what they're doing. You will, I guarantee you will be blown away by the sheer magnitude and scope of the effort that they're putting into finding treatments for HD. There's one special member of the CHDI team that I want to give an extra special shout out. Brenda, can you please stand up? This is Brenda Lager. Brenda is the genetically modified animal program manager in the Princeton office in, in, at CHGI, my, my former office mate. And um, I'm really happy to, when I heard that she is running the New York City Marathon to benefit HDSA in the fall. So can we give her an extra round of thanks? All right, on with the show. Let's go. On December 11th, news broke within the HD community that has generated a sense of excitement and hope that I personally have never experienced in my scientific career. The news I'm referring to, of course, is the announcement from Ionis that their study attesting the safety of the first ever drug designed to lower Huntington was a success. This news is over 25 years in the making. So many scientists, clinicians, and families have played a critical role in getting us to where we are here today. So to highlight the work of so many, I thought it would be uh, pretty cool if we just did something we've never done before and bring everyone, as many people together as possible, to tell you a story about how families came together to develop the first Huntington lowering therapy for HD. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to our stage our first storyteller for the morning, Dr. Jim Casella. Huntington's disease is a disease of families. Now, this, was, this fundamental fact was recognized as far back as 1872, and I guess I have to do that, right? No, I'm not doing it. Slides? Yeah, there we go. As far back as 1872, when George Huntington, the family doctor, uh, described the disorder, but most important, he noted its inheritance. 
It was also reflected in the formation in 1967 by Marjorie Guthrie and other HD family members of the Committee to Combat Huntington's Disease, which later became the HDSA and their lobbying efforts for research into the disorder. The importance of families for advancing HD research was highlighted in 1979 by the National Institutes of Health proposing to establish HD research centers and funding Mike Keneally, who unfortunately passed away last year, to establish a national research roster for Huntington's disease patients and families interested in participating in research. Huntington's disease is a disease of families because it is encoded in the sequence of the DNA, the genetic material, and passed on from generation to generation. Human DNA is made up of a varying sequence of three billion chemical units known as nucleotides and named A, G, C, and T. The DNA is a blueprint and operating software for the body, and it's read off in code in groups known as genes to make individual components of human cells and tissues. Long strings of genes are packaged into chromosomes which are transmitted from parents to children intact. Now, I began my career as an investigator at one of the new HD research centers with the goal of using the inheritance pattern of HD in families to track down the location of the human, on the human chromosomes of the gene that causes HD and then to identify its abnormal DNA sequence. The first clue to the HD gene's location came from a large HD roster family from the U.S. Midwest where a DNA marker on chromosome 4, a common variation, normal variation in human DNA, appeared to track with the inheritance of the disease through the family. The general vicinity of the HD gene on chromosome was confirmed in a large family from Venezuela, and this opened a path to identifying the nature of the DNA sequence that causes the disease. Now that path took another decade. It took a worldwide collaboration of investigators, uh, and most importantly, it took the participation of hundreds of HD families from the U.S. and Europe, many of these families coming via the HD roster and HDSA. It was necessary to find the gene to compare the chromosome 4 DNA from all of these families and to discover that HD is caused by a DNA sequence of multiple sequential CAG bases that has become abnormally long in a gene now named HTT, which specifies a protein that was consequently named Huntington. Now, each protein in the body has specific jobs to do, and it's made up of its own unique folded string of chemical subunits known as amino acids. Huntington protein is very large. It has more than 3,000 amino acids, and it helps with many different biological jobs in all cells of the body. Because the gene's DNA code is read three nucleotides at a time, and CAG is the code for the amino acid glutamine, persons with an HD-causing DNA sequence make a Huntington protein with too many consecutive glutamines. Something about having too many consecutive CAGs in HTT DNA or glutamines in Huntington makes certain brain cells susceptible to early death. In HD, brain neurons are lost in many different regions, but the most vulnerable cells, the medium spiny neurons in a region known as the striatum, show the earliest and greatest loss, which is responsible for the characteristic movements of HD. The rate at which this loss occurs depends in large part, but not exclusively, on the number of CAGs that a person inherits, with longer stretches of consecutive CAGs leading, on average, to earlier onset, but with considerable fluctuation from person to person. Recently, through the continued participation of HD subjects and families in genetic research, it's been possible to identify other genes, so-called genetic modifiers, that contribute to the variation in age at which HD emerges, and so widening the possible targets for developing HD therapies. The participation of HD families in research is a critical element that has moved knowledge of HD so far, but it remains essential for carrying through to completion of the HD research cycle 
to provide the ultimate benefit in the form of an, of an effective treatment. HD families enabled the discovery of the HD gene, which provided the option pr for predictive testing and pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. It also allowed investigators to identify persons carrying the HD mutation before they display the disease, allowing for deeper investigation of the early steps in the process. Knowledge of the gene and its expanded CAG stretch has also allowed a wide variety of studies in human cells and animal models to understand the mechanism of pathogenesis and, like a human HD modifier studies, to propose multiple potential routes for effective treatment. For any of these routes, continued participation of HD subjects will be essential for carrying out the clinical trials required to test the safety and effectiveness of proposed therapies. Today, we're going to talk in detail about the path taken down just one of those routes to develop a potential therapy that targets the HD gene itself to reduce the amount of mutant Huntington protein being produced. To begin that story, we're going to hear from Ann Smith of Ionis Pharmaceuticals, the company that has pioneered the development of an antisense oligonucleotide treatment for HD. Ann? Right. Am I on? Yes. Okay. Thank you, Jim. The scientists like Jim are an integral part of this story. Um, to do the work we do, we rely on a thorough understanding of the disease and its course. Really, without Jim and others like him, we would not be here today. As Jim said, my name is Ann Smith, and I work for Ionis Pharmaceuticals. As a company, we were formed in 1989 with a single mission. We wanted to create a brand new class of drugs that might help patients. This would be based on antisense technology, uh, which is probably a term you've heard, or maybe the longer form, antisense oligonucleotides, or an abbreviation, ASO, uh, three names for the same thing. So I want to take a few minutes today to talk about what an ASO is, um, what it does in the body, and why we're so excited about it as a potential treatment for Huntington's disease. So as I said, ASOs are a new class of drug. Let me talk a bit first about what they're not. ASOs are not small molecule drugs. Small molecules are chemically based drugs, some of which have been around for thousands of years. Herbal stimulants were found at Neanderthal burial sites. Morphine dates back to the 1800s. Um, in the 1900s, bears started to sell aspirin for rheumatism and other diseases. Today, small molecules represent the vast majority of drugs on the market, over 90% by some estimates and include many products you know by name, like Advil, Nexium, and Crestor. But ASOs are not small molecule drugs. They're also not protein-based drugs. So in the 1970s and 80s, there was the biotech era. And as an alternative to making drugs with chemical reactions, scientists started to find ways to manipulate living organisms, like bacteria, to make protein-based drugs that might be useful in human disease. Insulin and human growth hormone were some of the early ones. Uh, monoclonal antibodies came later. So now there are hundreds of really good protein-based drugs on the market, um, names like Enbrel and Humira, but ASOs also aren't protein-based drugs. ASOs, importantly, are also not gene therapy, but let's come back to that later. ASOs are DNA-based drugs. So there's a fundamental tenet of science called the central dogma of molecular biology, which describes how DNA makes RNA, which makes protein. Proteins are fundamental to life. They provide transportation in, of molecules throughout your body. They're important for structure of cells. They recognize invaders and help you protect you against them. They carry out thousands of chemical reactions that are important for everyday functioning. That said, this audience knows well that sometimes proteins are harmful. It's widely accepted that a particular protein, the mutant Huntington protein, is the root cause of Huntington's disease. So if we look at the central dogma, here I'm showing DNA in green. Um, again, where DNA makes RNA, which makes protein, you can begin to see how an ASO might be useful in HD. As Jim described, HD is your body's recipe book on how to make proteins, every protein that you need. DNA is this long string of units called nucleotides. It exists in a double helical structure that you can see up at the top there, nicely protected within the nucleus of cells. And when your body needs to make a protein, it just unwinds a bit and exposes the region that has the recipe for the particular protein that you need. 
Um, the cell makes a copy of that recipe called messenger RNA. Then the RNA molecule shuffles off to a little machine that makes the protein. It's a simple and elegant process, again and again. DNA makes RNA, which makes protein, until you throw an ASO in the mix. The ASO binds to the RNA and triggers the RNA to be destroyed. So no RNA means no protein is made. So in a situation where there's a known protein behaving badly, we can interrupt the central dogma. We can allow DNA to make RNA, but then the RNA is destroyed and doesn't have the opportunity to make the protein. So if we circle back to gene therapy, uh, I told you that the ASOs are not a form of gene therapy. And if we look again at the central dogma, you can see that there's another solution to a problem protein. Instead of interacting at the RNA stage, we could change the DNA. You could perhaps change the recipe for that bad protein so that it doesn't make a bad protein anymore. Or you could introduce a new piece of DNA to make a drug to help the body handle the bad protein. The main difference between ASOs and gene therapy is that ASOs don't change the DNA. ASOs are simply drugs that must be delivered periodically like any other drug you would take for a chronic condition. The ASO acts on the RNA, but it doesn't affect the DNA. And it's taken several decades of research by chemists and molecular biologists and others to design ASOs that are potent and protected in your body so that they don't get broken down. But when properly designed, ASOs are exquisitely specific. They go for a target RNA for a particular protein. They touch just that one RNA and they knock down just that one protein. ASOs are also dose dependent meaning that if you administer a small dose, you'll have a little bit of a reduction in the protein, and if you administer a larger dose, the reduction will be larger. So this allows us to tune the balance between the two errors on this slide so that we're sure we're knocking down the protein enough to benefit the patient, but we're doing it safely. I should note that ASOs can't completely eliminate a protein's production. We can't get to 100%. Invariably, some of the RNA molecules will make it to that little machine before they encounter an ASO. But with a large dose of ASO, we can get to 80 or 90% knockdown. As a new drug platform, ASOs are really just starting to hit their stride. We've had success in a lot of conditions. Um, anytime there's a protein that's behaving badly, designing an ASO to, take, to target it is a pretty good therapeutic strategy. And I've really only scratched the surface here. There are a number of different ways that ASOs can work, over a dozen. We were talking here about uh, designing an ASO to lower the amount of protein. You could also design an ASO that raises the amount of protein or even changes the protein itself. You may have heard about Spinraza, an ASO known as Nusinersen for people with spinal muscular atrophy or SMA. This is a terrible condition that it's in its most severe form affects a child's ability to sit, walk, and breathe and it's the leading genetic killer of babies. Spinraza was designed to change that reality. In this case, the ASO that we developed increases production of a critical protein. And what we're seeing with the drug on the market is that children who couldn't sit are sitting. Children who couldn't walk are walking. Children who wouldn't be alive are growing and thriving. So Spinraza has changed the field of SMA. It's been transformative for that disease. And there are similarities between SMA and HD. In both cases, there's a single known genetic cause. In both cases, that genetic signature leads to a problem protein. In SMA, too little. In Huntington's, too much. So in SMA, the ASO that we designed was able to travel through the spinal cord up into the brain, find the RNA to interact with, and change the amount of protein. And that's exactly what we want to do with Huntington's. We hope to design an ASO that will go up into the brain, find the Huntington RNA, and lower production of Huntington protein. We set out in 2005 on this path. We formed collaborations with experts in the HD field and with organizations that could contribute to the research. The first step in learning whether a drug might help people with HD is to learn whether that drug can help animals that have been designed to mimic the disease. And for this type of work, we often work with collaborations in academia. And this is where Holly Kordasevich comes in.
Like Anne, I work at Ionis Pharmaceuticals, but in 2006, I was working in Don Cleveland's lab at UCS. Now, I joined his lab to work on a really exciting project, and that was to develop oligonucleotides for the treatment of Huntington's disease. So at the time, we knew that Huntington's was caused by a CAG expansion in the Huntington gene, like Jim mentioned. We also knew that this disease was caused largely by the production of the toxic Huntington protein. We also knew from work that was done in Don's lab with Ionis on Lugarich's disease, or ALS, that oligonucleotides could be used to lower proteins in the brain. But that's it. Huntington was caused by a bad protein. ASOs could lower proteins in the brain. So we had a lot of questions that we needed to answer. So these are the main questions that we set out to answer. The first is, can we design an oligo that can get to where it needs to go and actually lower Huntington in the brain? If we do that, can we see a benefit in disease by lowering Huntington with an oligo? Do we need to lower just mutant Huntington, or should we lower both mutant and normal Huntington? And then finally, if we can be successful in all these things and go to human patients, how will we be able to measure that the oligo is doing what it's supposed to be doing in a human patient? And that's lowering the Huntington protein. And so I'll go through the work that we did to answer these first three questions, and then leave the last one for Doug to share. All right. So fortunately, when we set out on this quest, the HD community and researchers had already built a lot of the animal models that we could use to address these questions. And one of these animal models was actually built right here locally in UCLA by William Lang's laboratory. And so this mouse actually expresses the full length human Huntington gene. And because it expresses the full human Huntington gene, it makes the human Huntington RNA, which makes the human Huntington protein, and the mice end up having a disease that looks like Huntington's. We took these mice, we introduced oligos that target the human Huntington RNA, we introduced it into the fluid that surrounds their brains, and then we looked at the RNA within the brains of those mice. When we look at the RNA, and that's this graph here, on, oops, it's the graph on the left, we see that the RNA is down. And it's down for a long time. It's down for a few months before the levels start coming back to normal. That was really exciting for us. So because the RNA is down, as Anne explained, the protein should be down too. But of course, we want to check that ourselves. So we look, and this is looking at the Huntington protein. You see there's two little bands. We've got a mutant and a normal Huntington, and that's down. And it's also down for a significant amount of time. And so as we were starting to learn about oligos in the brain, we needed to really characterize that and ask questions. So as Anne mentioned, oligos can be dose dependent. But we wanted to look at this. So this is, again, a slight, very similar experiment, but with slight differences, just to ask a little bit different question. In the first experiment, we delivered oligo and looked over time. In this experiment, we give different doses of oligo. Look at a single time point, see if different doses can give us a different effect. And what you see here is that you can give one dose and get 50%. You give more oligo, you can get 80%. So the oligos are behaving exactly as we would want them to behave. And then also, the Huntington oligos can do this beautifully in the brain regions that matter for HD. So this is looking at the cortex, the outer region of the brain. And so we have the oligos. We think that they're working, getting really excited about everything. But the next question is, can we have an effect on disease? And there are all these animal models that have a Huntington-like disease because they express that mutant human Huntington protein. So this is one of the tests that we did. So this is a, um, it's called the Rotorad test. And you can basically think of it as log rolling for mice. They run on a rotating bar, and we, we measure how long it takes them to fall off. And the remarkable thing is when we lowered the Huntington protein, not only did the mice not get sicker, but they actually got better. And they not only got better in motor coordination, but they improved their survival. It was remarkable, the effects that we were seeing. And so in this example, you look at the rotating bar, and you look at that bottom black line. And that's an HD mouse that doesn't receive treatment. They're not doing well, and they tend to get worse over time. The top line, the top black line, that's a sibling that doesn't have HD, they do pretty good on this test. Now, if you look at the blue line, that's an animal that receives a Huntington oligo. The animals actually get better on the test. They're more similar to the litter mates that don't have HD, and then they stay better for a pretty long period of time. So this is after just a two-week treatment of oligo, and then looking at how they perform over the next year of their life. So again, really exciting results in animals. And we think we're having such a dramatic effect because we have an on-mechanism therapy. We're going after the heart of it. We're going to the cause of the disease. We're going right to that Huntington protein. All right. So as most of you know, I think most patients with HD, they carry two Huntington genes. One copy has the mutation, which is represented on the bottom, that longer CAG expansion Jim told us about. Another copy doesn't have that. 
And so while we were working in Don's lab, on the mice, there was other groups that Ionis was collaborating with throughout the globe, and some of those groups were working on looking at just lowering the mutant Huntington specifically. And there's multiple ways that you can imagine doing that, right? So the first, go after the mutation itself. Go right after the CAG. This is work that was really led in collaboration with Ionis by David Corey at Texas. The catch with this one is there's a lot of other genes that contain those CAGs. So it makes it really hard to lower Huntington without lowering a number of other genes. So another approach that also is going on, so this is the total Huntington approach where we just target anywhere we want on the whole gene. So when you think of that string of beads, there's 170,000 of those in the Huntington gene. Target anywhere you want, you can lower both. But there's a really interesting fact about our DNA. So there's those three billion nucleotides, but if you look from individual to individual, there's about 10 million of them that can be different. And there are these different mutations that occur, and normally they don't do anything. So fortunately they don't change anything, they're just there. And us scientists can take advantage of that. We can take advantage of these little nucleotide differences from individual to individual that we call SNPs. And even from individual to individual, but within the two different copies in your own genes, you can have differences in those sequences. And so these little SNPs, we can take advantage of that and bind an oligo that binds to those little mutations. And scientists were very clever and went and thoroughly looked at this, and this is work that was really championed by Michael Hayden's group up at UBC. They found that some of these little mutations are also found more frequently in some patients on the genes that contain the CAG expansion and not on the copy that doesn't. So if we design an oligo to target that, we can lower the mutant without lowering the wild type. And so this is exactly what we did. We went through and we designed oligonucleotides that can lower both copies or that can lower just one of the copies and potentially could take either of those proteins to the clinic. So we then again turned back to the mice. So which approach is better? Which one do we want to take forward? So we can go into mice, and this is again looking at that same data you saw before. So these are those mice running on that rotorot task. And here I've colored them so that the total Huntington oligo is again in blue. This is lowering both copies. And then when you lower just the mutant copy, you see the performance in red. So it really doesn't make a difference. Both of them improve the phenotype, and they do it similar and to a similar degree. So now we had a decision to make. So we sat down with our colleagues at Roche, and we decided to go forward with the total Huntington approach. And the rationale for that is that we didn't see a difference in benefit. We didn't see a difference in the safety profile. And with that approach, we can treat everybody with HD, which is the really important fact for us. Now, if you go after the SNP approach, you can treat some people, but not all patients. It also takes some complicated assays to make sure that you have that SNP right, and it also limits you to a certain spot on the gene, where with our compounds, we could look anywhere on that whole gene to find really the best, strongest, most active, safest drug to give to patients. So that's why we went forward with the total Huntington approach. Okay, so these are the highlights of some of the work that was going on, but this is the timeline with a lot of the key findings. So I only had touched on a bit of this. So this is to give you an idea of the amount of time it takes to really go through and do these things. But you can see how critically they am, important they are to making sure you're making the best decisions to give you the best success as you go forward. And so while we were doing this work, the next step was really getting ready for clinical trials. And so here I'll hand it over to Dr. Robert Precipice from CHGI. So while we were doing the work in the lab, CHGI was working to get patients ready for the clinic. And so not only were they there with us from the beginning to enable the research both at Ionis and at Don's lab, but they were also getting the community ready for the clinic so that when we were ready for the drug, we could go. Thanks so much, Holly, and good morning, everybody. My name is uh, Robert Pacifici, and I work for CHDI, uh, which is an organization that, as you heard earlier from George, is exclusively dedicated to advancing and accelerating meaningful therapies for one and only one disease, Huntington's. Um, our offices are located in New York, in New Jersey, and literally right down the block here in Los Angeles, uh, where I'm based. And um, we opened this office in part with the idea that um, there was a lot of good stuff going on, on on the West Coast. And we hope that top flight academic institutions and some of the biotechs that were located out here, uh, it would facilitate an interaction with them. So back in 2005, uh, we were delighted that two gentlemen got in a car, uh, Dr. Don Cleveland from the Ludwig Institute at San, in San Diego, and Dr. Frank Bennett, um, who was uh, the chief scientific officer at Ionis in Carlsbad, decided to pay us a visit. 
And um, it's a little corny, but that's the very conference room that we sat down in. And we hosted them uh, to hear about these early and promising results that suggested that Ionis's um, ASO gene silencing technology might be uh, usable to treat diseases of the brain, things like ALS, SMA, as you heard, and uh, fortunately also applicable in Huntington's disease. So CHDI uses what um, people refer to as the virtual or outsourced model. Uh, people know I'm not so fond of that word virtual because as you saw, uh, all those people with hoodies are very real. Um, and there are now 100 of us who cover all of the different core competencies that are necessary to do all the very different things that you need to do across the drug discovery pipeline uh, and to help out wherever it's needed. CHDI, the organization, is a not-for-profit foundation that's really generously funded by private donors, which means that our bottom line is time, not money. How fast can we go? And so unlike traditional for-profit companies, we don't have any competitors. We only have collaborators. And we're happy to enable investigators uh, at universities, at companies, wherever they may be, that have an idea or a technology that might be relevant to Huntington's drug discovery and development. And to do this, we provide whatever is needed. Sometimes it's funding, sometimes it's tools and reagents, sometimes it's our deep knowledge of Huntington's, uh, the disease, and a wide array of, of platforms uh, to enable their, their drug discovery efforts. So, for example, we might go to uh, a company and say, like, we like your stuff, uh, we think it's relevant to HD, and we want to enable you. Uh, we want you to get you to train your gun to think about Huntington's disease. You don't have to stop what you're doing. We know you have a bunch of other important projects, but we'd like you to work on Huntington's as well. And that's exactly what we did with um, what was then ISIS and now Ionis Pharmaceuticals beginning in, in 2006, nearly 12 years ago and continuing until 2013 when Roche entered the picture, CHDI funded and supported Ionis's HD program. So my job at CHDI is that of the Chief Scientific Officer, and what that means is that my staff and I are responsible for doing what's called translation. We take these really amazing discoveries that basic scientists make, like the one that you heard from Jim Gisela, and we think about how to translate that into a candidate therapy that my colleagues in the clinic can test to see whether or not it's, it's efficacious. So you can imagine how excited we were when we saw how well the collaboration that we had initiated with Ionis to explore their ASO technology was, was progressing. Um, and so we thought to ourselves, my gosh, you know, like this actually has a chance of working. We want to be ready so that if and when it advances to the next stage, the clinic is ready to receive this molecule and can go as quickly as possible because um, our bottom line is time. So one of the things that I really love about this community, and I've been fortunate uh, to, to work in it now for um, over a dozen years, is how well integrated it is from patients to researchers, caregivers, and clinicians. Uh, we all interact with each other in, in a really productive way. And as I'm fond of saying, there's nothing more important and precious to a drug hunter than an observation that's actually made in the population that you'd like to treat. So with this cooperation across the community, CHDI designed and funded a variety of what are called observational studies, including two really important ones, Track HD, which is now continuing as Track On, and Enroll HD. And the output of that study allows us to better understand the natural progression of the disease. And that's important because it helps companies like Ionis and Roche think about who they'd like to treat at what stage of the disease, and also to figure out where to find uh, those subjects for trials when the trial is ready. All of the programs that seek to lower Huntington's, and actually it's incredibly encouraging that there's a large number of them, and they're all very different from each other, and they're all at very mature stages now, entering in late preclinical and early uh, clinical development, um, share a common desire uh, that is to lower the protein that you heard about. And one of the things that's really important is not to have to wait for many years to figure out whether or not the drug was actually doing its job. Did it do the thing it was designed to do? Did it lower Huntington protein in the people that are being treated? And so in order to do that, um, my colleague Doug McDonald embarked on a quest to develop a test to measure Huntington protein levels with a variety of colleagues, and he's up next to tell you all about that. Uh, 
Uh, thank you very much, Robert, and uh, good morning to everyone. Um, my name is Doug McDonald, and I work in the Los Angeles office of CHDI, and I do the Hope Walks. Um, aren't they great? Um, I'm going to talk to you now about something called biomarkers. There are many different types of biomarkers, but the one uh, I was most interested in is um, can we measure uh, the effect of a drug um, to know that it's doing what it's intended to do, and that's lower mutant Huntington. So just like you can lower uh, your cholesterol with Zocor uh, and take a blood test and you know you're getting rid of your bad cholesterol, I wanted a test to know if I was getting rid of your bad Huntington. Um, as you can imagine, this is pretty challenging. Uh, you can't just take a blood test to know what's going on in the brain. So um, we went to an alternative biosample, and that's cerebrospinal fluid, or CSF. Um, and uh, that CSF will hold clues as to what's going on in the brain. So CHDI set out to develop these tests to measure mutant Huntington in CSF samples. OK. This is a cartoon of um, a particular way that you can measure proteins. So in this cartoon, uh, mutant Huntington protein is blue. Uh, and one of the more sensitive and specific methods to measure uh, proteins is called an immunoassay. Um, so, excuse me. I'm scripted. So we use two antibodies. Um, one of them is red. It's called MW1. It's actually named after uh, Dr. Milton Wexler. Um, it was created at Caltech. Yep. <laughs> it was created at the, or it was made and developed um, out in Pasadena, the California Institute of Technology, by the late Dr. Paul Patterson's lab. Um, and this antibody specifically binds that polyglutamine stretch that Jim Gasella told you about. Uh, the second antibody is called 2B7. And I've got no good story for the naming of that. Um, but it was created by Novartis, the large pharmaceutical company in Basel, Switzerland. Um, and when these two antibodies both bind or stick to the mutant Huntington protein and they become really close, and we have labels on them, they give off a signal. And the more signal that's given off, the more protein you have in your sample. And that's how we measure the bad mutant Huntington. Now, I couldn't do this alone. Um, CHDI works with many different collaborators. I told you about two of them so far, uh, Caltech and Novartis. Um, and the other one I'm going to tell you a little bit about is IRBM Permitus. So they are a biotech company outside of Rome, and they had the labs and the special equipment that we wanted to uh, use to develop and run these very sensitive assays to test for mutant Huntington. Next, we needed <clears throat> HDCSF samples. So I contacted two guys sitting here, uh, Ed Wild and, and Blair Levitt, um, and they reached out to their uh, HD patients, and they said, would you volunteer to donate CSF for this study. And we're very fortunate that so many did. And um, th th it wasn't so easy. Uh, so the way you have to donate CSF, I don't, maybe some of you have, um, is by a lumbar puncture or a spinal tap. Um, so it's a little arduous, but it is safe. And um, what we did was we took those CSF samples. Uh, this is a picture of some of the donors. You may recognize a few of them. <clears throat> and what we did was we took that CSF and we, um, it got sucked into this instrument, okay? This, this single molecule counting instrument. And it goes through an interrogation chamber, which I didn't name it that. The company that made the instrument did. And what it does is it's actually, that's a laser. And flowing through there, it counts one by one the number of mutant Huntington proteins that are going through there. And that's what gives it that very sensitive um, uh, detection. And so I was really pleased uh, back uh, several years ago to be able to report this data at the World Congress on Huntington's disease. It was the first ever report 
where we could actually measure mutant Huntington uh, in patient CSF. Yeah. Um, I just want to impress upon you that it wasn't a given that we were going to be able to do this. Several people and several other technologies had failed to be able to measure the mutant Huntington in CSF because the old assay technologies weren't sensitive enough. But with this single molecule counting technology, we did. So after this testing, um, we tested even more CSF samples uh, to show that the assay was reproducible and robust, and we published it in the Journal of Clinical Investigation. And it was a large effort, uh, many authors. Um, and with this publication, uh, companies like Ionis and Genentech Roche, who are working on hunting and lowering therapies, saw the potential to use this test for their clinical trials to measure mutant Huntington in the CSF of trial participants. They wanted to see if the ASO treatment decreased the amount of mutant Huntington in the CSF, which would reflect what's going on in the brain. And I'm very happy now to hand it over to Dr. Wild, who's going to tell you about that trial and some of these results. Ed? Thank you, Doug. So um, designing a trial to test a drug for the very first time in human beings is a pretty delicate business. You're asking patients to take a real risk, so it's super important to think really carefully about the design of the trial so that you can get the most possible amount of information from it and from the energy that the patients are being asked to invest in the trial. And you have to try and keep it as safe as possible. So planning for this first in-human trial began as early as 2011, and it's involved many scientists over the years. The core team at Ionis, who developed the drug, and a huge team offering advice uh, and expertise on the best way to design and run the trial. Uh, and that includes clinicians like Blair and me, and of course, my uh, friend and mentor, Professor Sarah Tabrizi, who's shown here, announcing the trial publicly for the very first time at the European HD Network meeting in Barcelona in uh, 2014. And Sarah went on to be the global principal investigator for the trial. So for those two years, Sarah's been my boss for 12 years, but for those two years, Sarah was everybody's boss. <laughs> <laughs> and the first challenge, significant challenge, was delivery. Um, unfortunately, if this drug was taken as a pill or even given as an injection into the blood, it simply wouldn't reach the brain at all, which is obviously where we want it to be. Um, but thankfully, uh, the brain has this back door, which Doug has already mentioned, the cerebrospinal fluid. And this is this clear liquid that surrounds the brain and uh, spinal cord. And if you inject something into this fluid at the base of the spine, from there it spreads up into the head and it can get into the brain. Um, and that might sound daunting or unpleasant, kind of squicky, but it's actually a relatively painless and quite common procedure. In fact, in the field of anesthetics, uh, spinal injections of anesthetic are given every single day in thousands of places worldwide. Similarly, uh, cancer chemotherapy often uses these so-called intrathecal or spinal injections. And it's actually just very similar to the lumbar puncture or spinal tap that Doug just described. Uh, but after withdrawing the sample of fluid, you leave the needle in place, attach a syringe, and inject the drug, and it ends up in the same place. But for me as an HD neurologist, so my day job with patients is basically sitting in clinic wearing what I'm wearing now, plus a tie, and uh, talking to them. Um, but to train in intrathecal injection was a brand new uh, routine, and so I spent several weeks visiting the cancer center linked to our hospital. Uh, this is the first time in 10 years that I'd worn scrubs. Looked like a proper doctor, right? <laughs> so that was a strange uh, but a very exciting few months training to give these injections. And uh, obviously this had to happen at every single site. Um, so what about the design of the trial? So traditionally clinical trials are divided into numbered phases. And in a phase one trial, the drug is given to small numbers of people to test whether it's safe or dangerous. And this usually starts in a phase called 1A, where the, tr the drug would be given to healthy volunteers, quite often medical students who need more cash. 
Um, <laughs> and then that would be followed by a separate phase in patients, and that's called phase 1B. So that's the first time the drug is given to actual patients. And then in phase 2, larger numbers of volunteers, patients, test the drug to help us find the right dose and to give us an idea of whether the drug is hitting its target. So for this program, time was of the essence. We wanted to do something quite innovative. And so we leapfrogged one step, and then we combined the next two. So healthy volunteers don't actually have a mutant Huntington gene. They don't produce mutant Huntington protein. So they actually wouldn't be able to tell us as much as we need to know about safety. So we skipped straight to phase 1B, which meant that the first humans to test the drug would be HD patients. And then we combined this 1B phase with a phase 2 study. So we designed a trial in which very small doses would be given to patients with HD at first. And then after careful review by an independent safety committee, the dose would slowly be increased for the next group of patients entering the trial. And we decided that each volunteer would receive four injections of the drug with a one-month gap from one injection to the next. And that would be long enough to see whether the drug is um, doing what it's supposed to do, uh, and also to test safety over that three-month interval, uh, but also ensuring that the trial would finish as quickly as possible so that we could find out the results. And uh, we decided that we would test the drug in people with very early symptoms of HD, and that was a deliberate decision which meant that the volunteers were well enough that they were all able to understand the risk and to give informed consent. And we would also, because they were pretty well at the start of the trial, we'd also be able to tell quite quickly if any worrying side effects emerged that might, for instance, make the symptoms of HD get much worse during the short period of the trial. And then finally, after very careful thought, we did decide to include a <coughs> placebo arm. So what that meant that one person in four in the trial would receive injections that didn't contain any drug at all. And that was to help us figure out whether any complications or any side effects that we saw were caused by the drug itself or <coughs> by, for instance, the procedures, the, the spinal injection procedures. And the study was blinded, double-blinded, <coughs> which meant that neither the researchers giving the treatments nor the patients knew whether a particular person was receiving the drug or the placebo injection. And that meant that any changes that we did see wouldn't be due to wishful thinking or bias on the part of anyone involved. And so the last thing to decide was what doses to try. And we knew that we needed to start with a really tiny dose, but how do you know how many milligrams to start with if you've only ever tested the drug in animals? And how do you know how high to go to achieve the effect you want but keep it safe? And that's where the really careful planning work of Ionis and Roche in the lab came in. They had given doses of ASOs to mice who have a tiny uh, brain, but they also gave, uh, gave the drug to bigger animals uh, with brains that are a bit more like ours, including pigs and monkeys. And all this work enabled them to develop a detailed model of how the drug would distribute throughout the nervous system when it was injected. And that allowed us to figure out what uh, dose of drug injected into the spine would correspond to what amount of lowering of the Huntington protein in the brain, and then how that would be reflected back into the thing we can actually measure, which is the concentration of the Huntington protein in the spinal fluid, which Doug talked about. And this model, this uh, model of how the drug interacts with the nervous system, was used to select a low starting dose, and then to decide how to increase the dose as long as everything was going well. And six uh, sites were chosen. University College London, Cambridge and Manchester in the UK, Ulm and Bochum in Germany, and Dr. Levitt's site, uh, UBC uh, Vancouver in Canada. And later on, three more sites were added, and those were Birmingham uh, and Cardiff in the UK and Berlin in Germany. And no, none of these sites had ever been involved in a trial to give drugs by spinal injection to Huntington's disease patients. So a lot of care and attention went into figuring out the best procedures and training all the staff as the sites came online in order to run the study properly. Because if something goes wrong in a first in human study like this, it can set things back by months or years. And you may have seen headlines from first in human trials that have gone wrong. And thankfully that didn't happen. Uh, but even if you have a good drug, uh, one error or one big safety mishap can set things back by months or years. And so safety was everything. And uh, so this was our final 
training meeting in London just before we gave the first dose. And you can see that at, at my urging, we adopted the philosophy of RuPaul. I won't say the whole thing. <laughs> but it's good luck and don't mess it up. And some of you may know what the real phrase is. Anyway, so finally we were ready to start, and on September the 3rd, 2015, the first injection was given in the trial by Blair Levitt, and I gave the first injection in Europe five days later, and that was uh, an exhausting week. <laughs> So of course we were excited to give the first injections, but we were mindful of the possible risks. And you know, as you give these injections, what's going through your mind is that you're injecting a drug directly into the nervous system of an HD patient, probably someone you've known for several years, uh, that's deliberately going to try and alter the workings of the genome in a fundamental way. So it's a serious business. But after a few more doses each, we gradually settled into a bit of a routine, actually. Uh, and it slowly, slowly became clear that we weren't encountering any major problems or complications. And every time we increased the dose, things continued to go really well. And before we knew it, two years had passed, and the trial was nearly complete. And so the big moment approached. Had the drug lowered the Huntington protein? Over to Dr. Levitt. <laughs> Thank you, Ed. So here we are now, two years later, uh, following that, that first dose of, of uh, the drug in the trial. And um, to say we were anxiously awaiting this moment would be an understatement. This was the moment when we were finally going to break the code and get the actual data for the first time. And, and, and spoiler alert, if you look at our faces, it's all good. It's all good. <laughs> So, so we, went, we went into this trial knowing that, um, that we could answer the question of whether it would actually be safe and viable to give a drug into the spinal fluid that would decrease the amount of mutant Huntington protein in the brain. And uh, that these initial results were going to be critical to the field. And, 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 I, and today I have the privilege and the honor to tell you what the study actually showed. Now, first and foremost, as Ed has said, this is a, a safety study. And one of the guiding principles in medicine is primum non nocere, or first do no harm. And we took this very seriously. We wanted to be sure that this was a safe and efficacious uh, medicine, and that we wanted to make sure that this treatment, which had never been given to humans before, could be injected, injected directly into the spinal fluid. Safe. <laughs> so, <laughs> I, I could stop now and this study was a success. It was safe. Um, we, were, we follow these patients very carefully um, and no participants dropped out of this study for any reason. There were minor complaints and concerns that were seen by patients in the study, as there are in every study, but there was really no difference in the incidence of those uh, findings from individuals who got placebo or those who got the active drug. They were all mild, and, and really the only uh, significant finding we found was some mild headaches after the spinal tap. And that's a well-known side effect of, of, of intrathecal infusions. About 10% of people had mild headaches, and they all resolved without any additional therapy. So mild analgesics, everyone got better. Uh, we looked very carefully. We looked at MRI scans. We looked at blood tests. We looked at EKGs. We looked for any clinically meaningful changes that suggested there might be adverse events. And really, there were no serious adverse events in anyone who got the active drug. There was one individual who stayed overnight in the hospital, was better the next day, and that was a person on placebo. So, again, <laughs> safe. <laughs> if you take home one message from this, this is an approach that is safe and well tolerated in individuals with Huntington's disease. So what else did we learn in the study? We learned a lot of things that, that scientists care about. We learned about how the drug gets <coughs> into the brain, how the levels of the drug 
vary with different dosing. And you guys probably don't care at all about that. <laughs> but what you do care about in the exciting data is that this is a drug that lowers mutant Huntington in the spinal fluid. And this is what that data actually looks like. This is the two, two of the highest doses looked over the period of time. And you can see that green line going down. Looks a bit like my stock portfolio. It pretty much always goes in that direction. In this case, it's a good thing. That's the mutant Huntington levels in the spinal fluid going down with successive doses of this. And as you can see, not only does it go down significantly, about 40%, but it continues to go down throughout the duration of the study. And that was really incredibly exciting for all of us. Um, and yeah, <laughs> as you've seen, this is the culmination of a lot of work. And importantly, based on some of those really careful models that, were perform that Ionis performed, we knew that this level of lowering in the CSF was equal to an even higher level of lowering in the brain. And that level of lowering in the brain in all of the Huntington's models that had been looked at was significant and was able to show clinical improvement in those models. So it gave us a great amount of hope that this level of lowering of mutant Huntington in the spinal fluid would give us significant benefits. So we can stop there again. The study was a success. It's safe, and we showed lowering of mutant Huntington. Can we learn anything else? I think we can learn more, but now we're entering into an area where we're not going to be able to prove anything. The study was designed to look at dose, look at biomarkers, and look at safety. But can we look at more in this study? And we did, and we looked at whether or not we can see any evidence that there might be some clinical benefit. And this is speculative, so this is not proof of benefit, but we're looking, we're looking at the data. And we looked at a very careful measure of progression. This is a short study. From start to finish, we were only uh, evaluating individuals over six to eight months. And that's not a lot of time in the life of a Huntington's person. But we do have sensitive measures based on the clinical rating scales that all neurologists do when they see patients. And we can put that together into a composite, a, a sum of how they're doing. And this is called the CUHDRS. And if you look, people with higher scores are doing better. So a better score suggests a better clinical situation. And when we look at all the patients now, and we don't look at individual doses, we just look at everyone across the board, whether they're on placebo or whether they're on Huntington's, and we say, how much did the level of mutant Huntington change? And the placebo group, which are clustered over on the, in the grave spots, there really wasn't any significant change. Some went up a little, some went down a little they tended to show a decline over that period of time. When you look at individuals that had the greatest amount of Huntington lowering, they actually tended to do a little better. So, and this was significant, but it is exploratory. And it's not proof of benefit, but it certainly is promising. So, the key findings in this study are that the ASO was safe and well tolerated at all the doses tested. The ASO lowers the levels of that toxic mutant protein in the CSF. And the individuals who had the greatest amount of lowering of mutant Huntington in the CSF looked actually better on some clinical scores. Again, it's a suggestion of benefit, but it's not proof. That will require subsequent studies to prove whether or not this actually makes a difference to patients. But as a testament to how well tolerated this was, all 46 individuals who were enrolled in the study can, completed the study, and all 46 of those individuals are continuing on the active drug in an open-label study. So that's the results of the study that we're going to present today. These are immensely promising data. And we would not be here today without the contributions of many, many individuals. And first and foremost, I want to thank the 46 brave individuals who volunteered. <laughs> these, 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 these are the... <laughs> they, they deserve a standing ovation. They let, they let Ed and I stick a needle in their back. So these are brave, brave people. And these are our heroes. So the contribution of these 46 individuals has moved this important research forward for the entire community. 
And you've heard about many of the characters who are involved in this. And one of the, I just want to call out one of my personal heroes. And that's this man here. He's very modest. This is Frank Bennett from Ionis. And uh, you might not have heard about him before today, but he's the one who had the vision and courage to lead the development of drugs uh, based on DNA, these ASOs, for neurologic diseases. And he pioneered the work in spinal muscular atrophy, in ALS, and in HD. Um, and so, a round of applause. This is really one of my personal research heroes. So it took many pieces coming together, and you've heard many of the pieces. It took uh, Ionis. It took important involvement from CHDI. It took um, the investigators coming together, and all these pieces of the puzzle came together without a hitch. And this study, uh, as has been mentioned, is, is the result of a number of individuals at across nine different study sites, and I'll just mention them again by name. Sarah Tabrizi, our fearless leader, uh, and, 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 and my boss for the last many years. See, Sarah's been my boss from, oh, so long ago, I can't tell you, but track on, track, this study. She's a, she's a wonderful scientist, a caring individual, and a great leader. Um, but there were also other individuals that were instrumental at the different sites. Uh, Dr. Saf Priller and Landermeyer in Germany, uh, Barkers, Crawford, Richards, and Rosser in the UK. And all of these contributions from all of these different groups came together to make this happen. And at the end of the day, the ASO worked exactly as Ionis had predicted it would. It lowered the amount of CSF mutant Huntington in patients with HD. <clears throat> So, incredibly exciting, and, and given the success of this first ASO study, Ionis and Rose have now flipped roles, and uh, there we have Eric <laughs> behind the wheel. Roche has moved to the driver's seat, and uh, I'm going to pass it on to Eric to tell you what's uh, coming in the future. Thanks for that, Blair. That's excellent. <laughs> And good morning, HDSA. How are you? Pretty incredible journey, wouldn't you agree? Yeah. Really an astounding story. And it's, it's a true testament, I think, to several things. One, it's a testament to having the courage to follow the science. It's a testament to remarkable collaboration in this community and to the determination and strength of HD families, really, is where it begins. So I'm incredibly humbled to have an opportunity to stand with these legends and to talk a little bit about the next couple blocks we hope to add to this really strong foundation that they've already built. Now, there's a lot of work uh, to go still. We're not there. Um, and to keep moving forward, it's going to require that same dedication to science. It's going to require that same level of collaborative effort and it's going to require still more determination and resilience from the HD community. But I know and have confidence that we're going to get there. So before we talk about the future, if you could allow me just a moment, quick introduction. I, my name is Eric Lundgren, and I lead the global HD program for Roche. Um, and this slide is really unnerving. <laughs> so, <laughs> so just in the spirit of transparency, um, I recently moved to Switzerland so that I could be a part of our HD team from, from just up the road in San Francisco. And um, but my actual car in Switzerland is a bike. So uh, <laughs> this has nothing to do with, with reality. Um, Blair gave me a hint that he might be doing something like this. And so, uh, again, I just want to be clear. He, he thinks I have finer taste in cars than I do, obviously. Um, I have a family car. and. Uh, it, uh, it's uh, that one. Um, <laughs> my wife lovingly calls it the roly-poly because it looks like a potato bug, and it drives like one too. So, um, <laughs> but, uh, so thanks for trying to make me look a little cooler though, Blair. I appreciate that. Um, but uh, so that's me. I'm, uh, I, I lead the HD team at Roche, and I have terrible taste in automobiles. Um, so. <clears throat> But let's talk about the company a little bit as well. Uh, we are new here, so I'll take a second to just introduce us. It can be a little confusing. You hear about Roche and you hear about Genentech. 
Um, and here in the States, you may not have heard about Roche at all very much, and so there's a reason for that. Um, in the US, um, Roche operates as Genentech. Uh, in the rest of the world, Roche operates as Roche. So um, it comes from a merger about 10 years ago, and um, it's one company, two names, and we do that just to confuse everyone as much as possible. So when you hear about Genentech or you hear about Roche and HD, it's one team doing the same amount of work. But more than a name, what matters um, is what we do. So uh, Genentech and Roche are really driven by two central pillars. One is a commitment to following science. Um, we spend $10 billion a year, every year, on research and development. That's more money than any company in healthcare. And most years, that's more money spent on research and development than any company, period. So we're very, very serious about science. And it's great to spend money on research and development, but you have to get results from that. Um, and, and we're very proud of that track record as well. We have over 37 treatments approved um, by the FDA. And we've really changed how we think about and treat diseases such as cancer, hemophilia, multiple sclerosis. And we're really excited to bring that legacy to HD. The other piece that really drives us is uh, unmet need. So we're really not into incrementalism. Uh, we focus on areas that need radical transformation. And that's really our focus, is disease areas where we can come in and make a really meaningful difference. And so I think you can probably understand why we're so attracted and, and desirous of joining the fight against HD. Great science and a huge need. And so that's why we're here. And so five years ago, <clears throat> Uh, we partnered with our dear friends at IONIS um, to join this fight. And what we saw was something really amazing. Kindred spirits, incredible science that you've heard about. It's just really, honestly, peerless work that's gone into setting the table for this. And a community that was so incredibly motivated and organized and, and prepared for clinical trials and to enter into the treatment era. And that is due to so many people in this room and the Huntington's community broadly, but I would be remiss if I didn't call out the special contributions of the PHDI. Um, really, I mean, it's really, truly remarkable. <laughs> and, and it's so important as drug developers to come in because you, you have confidence both in the science and in the hypothesis but also the tools are available. So we know so much about this disease that it gives us a running start, not a standing start. And so that's, what, that's, that's how, how we got in here. And so we jumped fully in. And our scientists joined in this effort, in this collaborative effort, to work on uh, refining the assays that Doug talked about, to think about what types of endpoints would be most useful in clinical trials to help measure whether or not a drug is working. And of course, standing aside are our, our, our friends in the, um, in the conduct and assessment of this incredible phase one study that Drs. Wild and Levitt just talked about. And so in five years, we've done a lot of work. And I can say now, we're far more excited and energized about this than we were even five years ago. We've learned so much. And we're at such an incredible point here in this journey. And we're now ready at Roche and Genentech to, tech, to step into the driver's seat, as, uh, as Blair said, and really drive this forward. And where do we start from? We start from that phase one study that we just looked at. 46 people, four monthly doses. And again, I think it'd be really nice if you guys could just clap again for, for those people. We'd be, we'd be absolutely nowhere without them, and it's so brave and courageous what they've done. Um, and moving from that, we're now able to consider moving straight from there to a larger, global, phase three, pivotal study. And this is a little bit unusual. Um, Dr. Wilde talked about the phases of drug development. It's not typical to move straight from a small phase one to a registrational study, but in this case we feel it's warranted for a couple reasons. First is you've just heard it. The story, the science, the foundation that we're building on is so rock solid, it gives us incredible confidence. Two, 
the study results we just saw were so encouraging. And three, and equally important to those, is the urgency, the need. Louise talked about it yesterday. Time is our enemy in HD. And so moving from phase one to a registrational phase three study saves us a lot of time. And so that's what we're gonna do. And <clears throat> and I know there's a lot of interest about this study. I've been hearing a lot of questions all week. Um, a lot of a lot of interest, and that's great. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about it, but I want to let you know, I'm not going to be able to answer every question. When's it going to start? What sites are involved? How big is it going to be? How are you going to design it? Those are extremely important questions, and I understand the urgency and desire to know. Um, but I don't want to stand up here and say something that I can't back up. So I don't want to stand up here and commit to a date that I can't control, because I don't want to mislead anyone. Um, so I appreciate your patience as we work through that, but I can tell you a few things about the study. Um, first, I've already said it is going to be global. So uh, Blair just talked about the phase one, nine sites, three countries. This will be a much larger network, global study. And we do plan to include US sites in this study. Uh, the next thing I can say is it will be longer. So the phase one study was, was small, was short. Um, it was four monthly doses, 13 weeks of active dosing. And we need to look at uh, dosing for a longer period of time. Um, I can't commit today to the exact length. We're still working out those details with, with our, our regulators as well as our collaborative partners up here. Um, but it will certainly be longer. So it'll be longer than a year. Um, another thing I can tell you about the study is we will have a placebo arm. Um, and I know that's not always the most popular thing. Um, but we had a placebo arm in the phase one, and I think Ed and Blair eloquently described why. And it's even more important as we step into larger studies. Um, because a placebo arm is really the only way that we can get answers to some really fundamentally important questions that I'm about to go through in a second. And then fourth, I can tell you that this study will be conducted in early manifest HD patients. Um, now, we have a desire to do more, um, but first, we have to take questions as they come. And where we have confidence and a base of knowledge to build and grow from, is coming out of that phase one study in early manifest patients. So that's where the study will begin. So I'm sure there's a lot more questions than that. Um, and I'm sure uh, what you really want is just for us to get started. Um, and we do too. Um, but we're working every day really hard with a lot of urgency on these extraordinarily important questions. And while we're working fast and we're working with urgency, we can't rush because this study is too important. It's too important to the HD community, and we need to get it right. And nobody can stand up on this stage, nobody would, certainly not me, and guarantee anything about this study. We can't guarantee success. But I can guarantee you that we're going to make really good decisions, and we're going to conduct the best study possible to answer really important questions in front of us. And that's what we can commit to. And as we do learn more, and as we do refine our answers to some of these questions, we're going to be communicative about that because we understand people want to know the answer to these really important questions. And we'll, we'll be as, as, as uh, transparent about that um, as we can as things start to lock down. But again, I don't want to say anything today that I can't control. Okay? So this study has a lot of work to do, though, a lot of big questions to answer. So I want to talk a little bit about that, too. There's a larger clinical development program beyond just the pivotal. And there is a session this afternoon, as George said, that uh, we can go into a little bit more, but for this, I just want to focus on the pivotal trial for a second. And there's a lot of weight that this study needs to lift. First question, can we replicate and extend the results we've already seen? It was a small study. So replication piece is easy. We've lowered mutant Huntington in the CSF in a small study. Can we do it again in a larger study, a more heterogeneous population? Can we do it again? That's replication, basic science. Extension kind of has two components. One is, can we do it in a larger group of people? That's extending it. And the other is, can we do it for a longer period of time? So can we lower Hunt Mutant Huntington and sustain that lowering for a longer period of time? That's the first question. The next question is around safety. And we're laser focused on safety. You heard, do no harm. It's really the focus of the first study. It continues to be a focus as we move forward. And we're really encouraged by the safety profile, and Blair just talked about that. 
from the phase one. But again, it's a small study and it's short. And we don't know enough information yet about the safety of this potential therapy to be comfortable answering all of your questions, letting you know what you could expect if you were to consider going on it, and how to inform your doctors about how best to manage your care. And we need answers to those types of questions before we can think about broader availability of the study, of, of the drug. So safety is a huge focus going forward in this study and in everything we do. And finally, last but maybe most importantly, is clinical benefit. Does the drug impact the course of Huntington's? By how much? In what ways? Does it affect how you move? Does it affect how you think? Does it affect behavior? Does it affect all of those? These are hugely important questions. And while lowering the putative cause of Huntington's disease is a massive step forward, I don't think any of us are up here working on this to lower a protein. We're up here to slow or stop the relentless decline of Huntington's. And if that's what we want to do, then we have to prove it. And the proof has to come from this study. So that's a lot of things that this study has to do. So again, we're working really hard on this every day, uh, and I'm committed to getting it right. Um, so, uh, we're, and we're going to work on getting started as soon as we can. And of course, it's certainly not just me. I have the honor of, of standing up here and representing a huge team uh, at Roche, a global team. Um, this is an incredible group of people. Our team is dedicated to Huntington's disease. So this is all we do. Um, and it's a team comprised of physicians, biostatisticians, assay developers, manufacturing people, regulatory experts, people who are dedicated to listening to and engaging specifically with the Huntington's community so that we can get your knowledge and pull it into our programs as we go forward. It's a team unique on the teams I've been on for its passion and its commitment, and I think we get that because we draw it from this room, from this family. And we try to act as a mirror to reflect back all the great things and the strength that we see out of the Huntington's community. Because it's certainly not about Roche or Genentech or any of us up here on this stage. It's about this room and this community and getting it right. And together, Together, I think we can usher in a new era in Huntington's disease, an era in which futures aren't determined by a genetic anomaly, a future in which you have the tools and your doctor has the tools to push back against the relentlessness of this disease. It's going to be a future that counts on and builds on this great science, it's going to be a future that counts on this collaborative spirit in this room and in these teams. And it's going to be a future that's built out of and empowered by the resiliency and the strength of HD families. And I do think that we can get there. I do think, together, we can transform Huntington's disease. I really do. And so there is a lot of work in front of us, and this is not going to be a linear path. It looks nice and sort of linear today, but it won't be. It hasn't been, by the way, and it won't be going forward. It's going to be twisty and ups and downs, and we've got to stay together through this. Um, and I know that we will, because this group always has. So um, I'm going to wrap up and just, again, say thank you. Um, it's such an honor to be up here with these guys. Um, it's such an honor to, to feel the warm embrace of the Huntington's family. Um, that's extraordinarily meaningful um, to us. And uh, we're just so privileged and blessed to um, be a part of this fight with all of you. And together, I'm really excited about where we're going to go. So. so with that, we're going to end where we began, which is putting Huntington's family's back in the middle of this story, and so please welcome me in uh, 
uh, in welcoming George Yorling back to the stage. There you go, George. Thank you, Eric. So as we put this story together for you, I was reminded of a slide or a thing that Ed said, I think, on this very stage a few years ago, and that science is cumulative. And this, this story, I think, is the epitome of that. Day by day, month by month, year by year, we've made progress collectively that's built upon our, our observations and experiments we've learned along the way to get us to where we are to here in 2018. Our technology has caught up. To, to bring us to this monumental moment. And um, one thing has remained constant. While we have co committed industry partners and academic partners, one thing's always been constant. We have a HD community that is willing to do anything to make this world free of HD. So <laughs> clearly, we want this story to have a fairy book, fairy tale ending. And uh, we know the story, the end of the story is not written, but I think we're all confident, uh, hopefully you can tell, we're all confident this is going to have a good ending. We're going to need more research heroes. I learned, we learned at the luncheon yesterday at the Galaxy of Heroes that there are, I was so shocked by how many volunteers, HD volunteers, research volunteers there are in this room. We're going to need hundreds more to get this across the finish line. These are just some of my heroes. Some of them are in this room right now, and I get great inspiration from them. And uh, I'm very confident with them and all of you that we are going to get this done. Since, since news broke on December 11th, we have been inundated at HDSA with calls from families asking, George, what do we do? I want in. What, do you, what would you do? And, you know, we thought, I think a lot about this, and we thought, you know, for us to say, be patient, let's just kind of, let me be blunt, it's pretty crappy advice. <laughs> I wouldn't want to hear it, right? <laughs> but I'm not going to say that to you. But there are four things if it, that I would do, and I recommend to you, is make sure you're seen by an expert. Rather go to an HDSA center of excellence, um, places where they're doing research and you're getting multidisciplinary care. If you can't make it to a center, um, maybe you like your doctor. Make sure you're at a doctor that can recommend you or refer you to a research study. Sign up for Enroll HD. We've heard about it. You're going to hear about it later on today. This is where companies like Roche and Ionis and others, this is where they go to look to find the patients that they need to complete their study. Look, out, look after yourself. Eric just mentioned that these next studies are going to involve early manifest patients. So what is it you can do today? keep yourself healthy, to make sure that you don't deteriorate and, and fall out of the inclusionary criteria for the upcoming study. And finally, as soon as we know more, as soon as Roche, Genentech have information to share about trial sites and, and criteria, we're going to have it in HD Trial Finder. So sign in to hdtrialfinder.org to learn more. Finally. This is just one approach. We are so lucky as an HD community. There are no short of like a dozen different companies, many of them here this weekend, that are working on different ways around the central dogma that you heard Ann talk about to either attack the DNA, the RNA, or protein of Huntington. And I'm very confident that I'm going to be standing on this stage with another group of 10 folks, maybe it's next year, maybe it's the year after that, where we're going to be talking to you about the progress we've made to lower or affect the target that DNA, RNA, or protein of hunting. So I'm going to wrap up. And as, as Jim mentioned, this story started more than 25 years ago with family. And it's only fitting that this story ends today with a family member. So I want to turn it over to um, a very special family member. She is a longtime HDSA volunteer an HDSA research champion, research hero, a cancer survivor, and oh, by the way, the 2017 HDSA Person of the Year, Amy Fideli.
Okay, we're here. Okay, I'm super nervous, you guys, so <laughs> bear with me. Um, first of all, hello, everyone, and thank you. I'm so honored and blessed to be standing on the stage today. Um, can we have all the researchers in the audience stand? CHDI, Roche, Ionis, HDSA, everyone just stand that's been behind this research. Let's applaud these people. And thank you, thank you for everything you guys have done. Thank you for everything you're doing for the HD community. For the most part, finding out you have Huntington's is an overwhelming, life-changing bomb of information. Eight years ago, there really was no hope for us. And the path forward meant waiting for onset and managing symptoms. I know since I received the H-bomb in 2010, I discovered I was positive for the HD gene mutation and my CAG count was 41. Hope was not part of the conversation. My story could stop there, but it doesn't. My challenges may seem extraordinary to many people in this room, but I'm a fighter and I'm filled with faith, hope, and love, and I am determined to change the ending of my story. I come from an HD family, and I come from a family that's been hit with Huntington's disease very hard. I'm a caretaker for my beautiful mom, who's right there in the middle. <laughs> and she's in the middle stages of HD. She's had psychosis, and most recently, chorea. My mom's older sister passed away from HD at age 63. My mom's younger brother, 59, He's also positive for the HD mutation with a CAG count of 42. He is symptom-free through faith and healthy lifestyle. Their oldest brother ran away at age 38, and they believe he was having symptoms related to HD. With an ongoing effort to locate him, we received news that he had passed away in 2008. They inherited this gene from their mother, my older brother does not have, carry this gene, which means my beautiful niece won't have HD. <laughs> this has touched and formed the story for every part of my life, including my choice not to have children. It's actually my husband and my choice not to have children. We feared of passing this gene on. This was one of the many steps I've taken to change my story and my legacy. For many marriages, this is the deal breaker. For Matt and I, it's just a blimp in the story. <laughs> I had to add something funny here, so <laughs> had a little help. <laughs> I knew I needed to be brave and bold. If I was going to change my story, I'm not a scientist and I'm not a doctor, so I did everything in my power. I needed to sign up for these trials. I needed to raise money for research. I needed to raise awareness. This, for me, has become my life purpose. By the way, this is my uh, pre-chemo hair. <laughs> Apparently, I should have added luck to my mantra. In March of 2017, a few months into participating in the Legato HD trial of Liquidamone, I was diagnosed with stage three breast cancer. I had to withdraw from the study to be treated. I'm very happy to share with you today that I have finished my last count round of chemo and my PET scan showed clear of cancer. With all of the incredible research happening today, I feel the same result is possible for HD. We've had some really hopeful uh, HD research news lately, and I want to tell you how the HD community has responded to the Ionis and Roche trials results that 
they may have identified a safe drug to lower Huntington. We are so happy and extremely hopeful. Thumbs up to lowering Huntington. <laughs> Having the opportunity to speak to Ionis and Roche and all of the other HD researchers in the audience today, I would like you to know that our HD community is grateful for all the countless hours you have spent working on eliminating HD. We are desperately waiting for these studies to be done and the drugs to be available. The clock is ticking for us. Please do make this affordable for us and we need to have this available to all stages. Some words of motivation to my HD community. We are the only people that can make this happen. Don't give up. Our HD warriors and HD families need to participate in any available studies. I believe the upside of the HD gene must be our strength as overcomers and warriors. We need faith, hope, love. That is my team name for Team Hope. Faith is the substance of things not hoped for, but evidence of things and the evidence of things not seen. We all need to stay motivated. We need to stay hopeful. My hope and motivation comes from sharing my HD story with, with others, participating in studies, and bonding with all of you in our HD community. My story does not end with Huntington's, and neither does yours. We are at an exciting time, and all of us need to work together to rewrite this book. Thank you so much.